Hello and welcome to the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. My name is Claudia Rizzini. I'm the Executive Director of the Fellowship Program. The Institute is one of the world's leading centers for interdisciplinary exploration. We bring students, scholars, artists, and practitioners together to pursue curiosity-driven research, expand human understanding, and grapple with questions that demand insights from across disciplines. You can be a part of this vibrant community by attending public programs such as this one, visiting virtual exhibitions, or pursuing the special collection held at the Schlesinger Library. To learn more, you can visit radcliffe.harvard.edu and sign up to receive more information on news and events. We'll begin the program with a presentation by Anna Paiva. After the presentation, the speaker will respond to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time throughout the program. We ask that you keep your questions brief to allow us to address as many as possible in the time that we have together. It is my pleasure to introduce this year Catherine Hampson Bessel Fellow Anna Paiva, a computer science professor at the Instituto Superior Tecnico Universidade de Lisboa in Portugal. She is also the coordinator of a research group on artificial intelligence for people and society, which investigates the creation of complex systems using an agent-based approach, which is with a simple focus on social agents. In this role, she has promoted and coordinated national and international projects. But Professor Paiva's main area of research includes the problem and techniques for producing social agents that can mimic human like behaviors. Throughout her career, she has furthered this field by engineering social agents that display specific capabilities, including emotions, personality, culture, nonverbal behavior, empathy, and collaboration. At Radcliffe, Professor Paiva is studying the setting and mechanism that promotes societies of machines and humans to be more pro-social. Pro-social be behavior happens when individuals elect to complete actions that benefit others at the cost to themselves. Professor Paiva will explore, explore how to design agents that collaborate while engaged in human settings. Furthermore, she will study how these agents can cultivate cooperation and involve people in contributing for the social good. Her project dares to imagine a future where intelligent machines will be able to act for the good of society and encourage pro-social behavior. Professor Paiva has written extensively on AI, publishing over 250 papers and has earned multiple best paper awards. Most notably, she won first place at the 218, uh, sorry, 2018 AAAI Conference on Artificial Intelligence Blue Sky Ideas Conference track. Since 2019, Professor Paiva has been a fellow of the European Association for Artificial Intelligence. She has been a member of the Science Europe Scientific Advisory Board and worked on the Council for the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda in AI and Robotics. Professor Paiva received her PhD in Artificial Intelligence from Lancaster University in the United Kingdom. And now it is my pleasure to give the floor to Anna Paiva. Oh, th thank you. Thank you, Claudia, for the kind introduction. So uh, I want to start by thanking the Radcliffe Institute for this opportunity to be part of a vibrant community of fellows that not only inspired me during these past eight months, but fundamentally changed the way I look at my own research. I want to thank Claudia and the members of the staff at Radcliffe and in particular, Sharon and Rebecca, for their unbelievable effort to keep us all together as a group. It has been just wonderful. I want to thank Catherine at Hampson Bessel and my sponsors for supporting this incredible journey. I want to thank my associate partners, Isabel and Esther, for their hard work. And finally, I want to thank all my collaborators, in particular, Fernand Sanch, Felipe Correa, Francisco Sanch, Francisco Mel, and Paula Ferrey. They are the reason why I'm here, I can be here. So my talk today is a vision for a future where humans and machines collaborate to form this pro-social society. I've been working on this vision for the past couple of years, and during the past few months here at Radcliffe, I've been consolidating it, writing about it, and even 
challenging it. But let's go back to a year ago when the COVID pandemic turned our world upside down. At the time, with many of us in lockdown, many people engaged in support activities. All over the world, there were signs of solidarity towards the neighbors and little acts of compassion were propagated. We watched neighbors in Italy singing opera to each other, shops distributing free food, such as the creamery in Wisconsin, uh, providing free milk to everyone. In the UK alone, there were more than 4,000 help groups formed on Facebook and WhatsApp, just offering help and food, especially to the elderly. In Portugal, one site, SOS Vizinho, was created just in 48 hours to organize the support for people suffering. So kindness was celebrated. Now, yet in spite of the strong evidence that humans are altruistic, we're also confronted with antisocial behavior, hate speech, polarization and aggression. And all of us, whether passively by ignoring unfair actions or through our own selfish acts, we are perhaps contributing to a worse society. Studies like the one I, I mentioned here report suggest that empathy is decreasing and a large meta-analysis conducted in 2011 that captured a period of 30 years indicated a decrease of empathy during that period. Now, there's one question that we should ask, and that is, are machines contributing to this decline and making us humans less humane? What role does technology and artificial intelligence, AI in short, play in this de decline? It is undeniable that the rise of these technological giants has promoted a society that is less equal and more divided. And increasing interaction via machines and reliance on algorithms for decision-making may also lead to a decrease in our sense of responsibility towards others. Yet, I don't think we can stop this technological revolution. So maybe it is our role as academics, roboticists, AI scientists, to address these concerns and use our knowledge and techniques to counteract the potential negative effects of technology. A new hybrid society is emerging where these intelligent machines or agents and humans must act together, delegate and, and collaborate to solve tasks. Therefore, machines have to interact with us, humans, and thus be social. So AI really needs to be social, and these social aspects encompasses the capability to perceive the humans, their attitudes, motives, intentions, preferences, actions, but it also implies competences in the communication, in establishing relationships, and be able to adapt to the humans. But to really have social intelligence, AI, should also have the capability to take actions towards the social environment, follow norms and adopt morally appropriate actions. AI can no longer just be a technological endeavor. It also must embrace the role it plays with and for humans in a society. And so this leads me to the title of my talk, pro-sociality in hybrid societies of humans and agents and robots. And pro-social behavior is the one directed at helping or benefiting others uh, or the society at one's cost. So the question that I've been focusing in the past couple of years, and that has underscored my work here at Radcliffe is the following. How can I design, how can we design agents which put together, immersed with humans, can promote collective uh, and pro-social action in situations that not, it wouldn't occur naturally. 
This means how can we engineer AI that promotes pro-social pro behavior, helps people to address aggression, uh, support social good, and promote sustainable habits. And to address these, I've divided, I've been dividing these into two main areas, two main um, uh, parts, the scientific and engineering challenges. On one hand, we need to understand and model the processes of prosocial behavior in humans and agents together, as well as in populations, allowing us to make predictions, test conditions, and see the effects that these technologies have. On the other hand, we also need to design and engineer these capabilities in the AI systems to support the collaboration, to establish empathy, because empathy is one of the major factors for, uh, for uh, altruistic behavior. Provide transparency, making actions understandable and justifiable, and actually adopting social norms in the design. And many of these challenges are actually being addressed by uh, many in the social AI community as a whole, and particularly in the past few years. But my, in my talk today, I will cover uh, mostly three areas, taking, taken from the research that I've been doing, and also the ones that uh, feel more uh, confident and make, uh, I believe it makes salient the challenges and the results achieved. And, I will start with the first area that uh, it, the majority of my work is based, which is pro-social robotics. And I'm going to start with a small example. A couple of years ago, I challenged my students in the social robotics course to develop a scenario to motivate people to pick up trash. Uh, you know, on the beach in, in Lisbon, sometimes uh, there's a lot of trash being left. So we built a simple rubbish bin, teleoperated, and to test it, we spread uh, litter on the main hall of the campus at the university at seven in the morning with authorization. And we had two conditions, one where the robot was there, static, a typical trash bin, and the second one, the robot would go and nudge people into action. And this is what happened when we tested it at the university. I'm going to share my view. <laughs> that the hall was full of litter and, and uh, some people did actually pick it up in the nudge condition. Well, many people pick it, picked it up in the nudge condition. So uh, inspired or encouraged by these results, I encouraged um, students from next year, so another set of students, to change the setting and I'll try to replicate the same effect, but this time in a private room rather than a hallway. People would come into the lab, perform a small little task uh, on the iPad, sat on the sofa that you can see, and then the robot, the trash pot that you can see on top of the Pioneer, would move around nudging participants to pick the trash that was spread around in the room. And what happened? Well, no one picked the trash. Now, we can question why. What are the conditions that makes such nudge not work in this last situation, but worked in the first one? We can speculate that in the public space, people were willing to contribute to the social good, but in the private space, well, participants felt it was not their responsibility, or maybe it was the type of robot or the movement. Well, we don't know. Therefore, we need data, we need studies, we need engineering to tell us 
how to foster pro-social behavior with these robots. And indeed, as we place these intelligent agents in the physical world as robots, many challenges emerge. Many variables come into consideration like the decision making, uh, its embodiment, the context, the verbal and nonverbal behavior, the social setting, and much more. And uh, I'm going to provide you with two simple examples illustrating how we have not only engineered, but also studied some of these variables. And the first one studies the power of gestures and nonverbal behavior, in particular handshakes. In certain cultures, um, handshakes are very powerful, well, before the pandemic. Uh, it's a powerful nonverbal behavior that can influence how individuals perceive social interaction partners. It can indi indicate their interest in future interactions, like this case in the picture. So if a robot has the arms and the hands, would a simple presence of a handshake have any impact in the willingness to cooperate and to help? Well, we tested this effect with the robots that you can see in the picture. It's called Visi. This is a humanoid upper torso robot built at the Robotics Institute here in Lisbon at IST. It has 30 degrees of freedom, mostly in the arms and the hands, with 23 in the uh, uh, arms and the hands. And as humans use this visual, haptic, and proper perception data to perform a handshake, we, uh, the people designed the handshape relied on human data to create the handshape for PC. And on, given that handshake, we created a, a small experiment scenario in the lab to test its impact. Subjects were invited into the lab and as they arrived, they were greeted by this robot, Fizzy. And we had two conditions. One, where the greeting, was done with just hello by Vizi, and the, one, the other one where it did exactly the same, but with a handshake. People had to follow a set of instructions, perform a task, and, and the robot had to do exactly the same task. However, there was a small problem. The robot could not complete the task without the participant's help, because there was a box in the way to the, towards the goal. In the video that I'll show you, you'll see one of the participants executing the task and helping the robot. So you see the robot doing the handshake. Now, this cannot pass. And then they both do the task and return. Now, the question is, would you help a robot in need, even being a robot? And would a handshake make a difference? Well, it did. The results show that indeed the handshake made a difference. Not only people consider the robot more likable and warm, when it greeted them with this handshake, but they were also willing to help the robot in the future. So to summarize, these handshakes are powerful and very simple uh, nonverbal behaviors that we include in our embodied agents. And, and they have the power to make relationships with users more natural and thus promote collaboration. But it's not only the gestures and the embodiment that impact humans promoting cooperation. The decision-making itself is another factor. And what happens if a robot follows an individualistic uh, optimal path to obtain the best reward, like maximizing its utility, its reward, instead of considering the team or the group as a whole? Would people like to interact with such a robot? Now, to analyze this question, we designed another scenario and created two autonomous robots 
uh, here in the picture, one on the left is Emmys and the one on the right is Glyn. And the human, together with the human, they form this hybrid team. The two robots play quite differently. Emmys is a selfish one. He's trying to obtain the best reward uh, that in the game they're going to play. The other one is the prosocial one. Now, in terms of their verbal and unverbal behavior, it was otherwise identical. The team played a simple game, a social dilemma, and players individual, individually face a dilemma between cooperating, so they could cooperate, like the pro-social life, or defecting, uh, try to gain as much possible at the expense of the others. However, the individual profits can only be achieved if a certain collective threshold is reached as a team. Otherwise, everyone loses, well, with a certain risk. This collective risk social dilemma exists in various uh, real world situations, and in particular, in uh, cases of prevention, uh, dangerous climate change. So let me now um, show you a small video of a uh, participant interacting with the two robots. Okay, in this situation, the team lost. And you can see how expressive the participant is towards the robots. And you can also see her consoling the pro-social robot because it collaborated and in the end they lost. So in a user study conducted with 70 participants, we manipulated winning and losing, which corresponds to achieving the threshold or not. And we tested the impact that such outcome, a good outcome or a bad outcome would have on the preferences and actions of people in this group. The results show that the pro-social robot was perceived much more positively, warmer, nicer, and this happened to all of our subjects. However, the outcome of the game, winning or losing, was considered in the perception of the robot and the preferences of the team. That means the part, when the participants won the game, people thought that the, it the, didn't matter the selfish um, robot. So when one wins, it doesn't matter if there's a selfish member in the team, even if it is a hybrid team, and even if the selfish is uh, an artificial one. However, when things don't go well and they lose, they start blaming the selfish robot, they consider it less competent, and they do not want it for the future in their team. And these results can even be explained and confirmed for large population using methods from social simulation. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So what we've learned, we learned that the creation of these hybrid teams with pro-social and selfish uh, agents needs to consider partner selection and it depends on previous outcomes, even for artificial partners. But social agents can also be um, embodied in different ways, such as character in games, chatbots. So I'm going now to proceed to a second area that uh, we've been working and I feel uh, very strong about and is pro-social games. And I'll start with the bystander effect or bystander dilemma. Polarizations and cyberbullying is ramping up like never before. And social media is considered as actually promoting and intensifying this 
types of behavior. And one of the problems with cyberbullying is that people ignore bullying acts. They dismiss them, we dismiss them. A theoretical framework that explains these situations is known as the bystander dilemma. And it was originally developed by Latan and Darley in 68. And it's well established with strong empirical evidence in social psychology. And the dilemma captures the following. If someone faces a situation where another person is in distress, if there's also other presence uh, available to respond, then one is less likely to respond or be slower at doing so. However, if that person, if when we watch, we know if there's, we know to be the only one watching the distressing event, then we're most likely to act. And this theoretical framework has been empirical, observed in a wide variety of situations, not only in cyberbullying, but also in cases of domestic violence, for example. So the question to consider is, how can we build agents that counteract this bystander effect and instead make the prosocial actions more visible, salient to be chosen, even when there are many others in the scene, like in social networks? Prosocial behavior can be a determining factor in reducing aggression in social networks and building social support. So with that in mind, I'll describe this pro-social game that relies on psychological theories of pro-social behavior to address the problem of cyberbullying to foster uh, that type of uh, behavior, uh, pro-social behavior. Uh, and I, I really think this is an imp uh, important area. So, we took inspiration from real cases collected with the population of teenagers. And the game actually features um, a hybrid network of both humans, so three is a multiplayer game with 12 agents. And the actions of the agents are guided by the data collected with real world cases. And its implementation was, um, we use the social cognitive model to capture aspects of in-group and out-group and implemented uh, parts of that model into the computational architecture for the agents. So in the picture, you can see a network of the humans, three, a player, two colleagues, and then all the other ones are agents that will act and interact amongst themselves. So the victims and the cyber bullies and the bystanders are amongst the agents and their actions in the network actually serve as catalysts to nudge the players into these collaborative social pro-social interventions. Now, a user study was conducted to assess the impact of the game uh, with these agents in the groups, uh, groups of three, uh, three uh, adolescents. And to test the impact, there were three conditions. The experimental condition uh, was the condition where uh, children played the game. And then we had another alternative intervention condition, usually adopted in schools, where stories are created following more or less the same stories that exist in the game. And finally, a control condition where uh, there was just regular classes being held. And the study ran in schools in Portugal with 211 adolescents involving three different schools and eight different classes. And uh, children, they were between 13, 14, and 115 played the game, so were exposed to the experimental uh, condition. Uh, the, the study ran for nine weeks, including five weeks where they played the game uh, every week. Uh, with different episodes every week. So let me now briefly show you the results of this intervention. We took many measures, but apart from other measures, we collected two main associated with empathy and prosocial behavior. We measured cognitive empathy using uh, the perspective taking scale that gives us an indication how good one is to put yourself into the shoes of someone else. And another measure collected uh, was the uh, task 
assessing the prosocial assertive behavior. Now, the results that you can see with both of these measures show a clear increase from the pretest to the post test uh, in the experimental condition. In fact, you can see this increase, whereas the other two, there's no increase. So um, this increase actually shows that we can have a pro-social game that simulates these hybrid groups of humans and agents. And those agents and their actions, their transparency and so on, can nudge uh, the lessons to be more pro-social. Now, to summarize, building virtual agents in games can be engineered to act in ways that make actions transparent, increase empathy, and improve pro-social assertive behavior. Obviously, this is just a small example, but I believe I, I truly believe that these types of games, pro-social games, may have a large impact in addressing social problems that result from the lack of perspective taking uh, or understanding others. So finally, in the remaining time that I have left, I want to talk about scaling up and how we can study the effects of social agents. But now, so we started with interactions, then we moved into groups, and now we're going to population, at the population level. Okay. And I will um, start with a quote. I really like this quote from a Swiss philosopher uh, that captured, I think, brilliantly this essence of altruism going beyond these social interactions and is something that can be propagated at the population level. So to study pro-sociality at the population level, we, we cannot, actually, we cannot do the same tests as we do with simple groups, or simple, or simple uh, interactions with robots. So we need to use different techniques. So we need to rely on techniques for social simulation to simulate large population and make predictions on how these technologies may impact our society. So we can look at techniques borrowed from evolutionary population dynamics and evolutionary biology that will allow us to understand and describe the ecology of behaviors in large population. Now, imagine I want to simulate a population of 100 or 1,000 people. And let's consider a very simple scenario where I have three possible strategies, uh, pro-social, selfish, and kind of indifferent or apathetic. And I can simulate them as little entities in a big population. And by simulating the interactions and considering the evolution of the behaviors and the strategies over a period of time, and as these agents watch and copy each other's um, actions, we can observe how the population evolves. For example, in this case, let's say that the black circles represent selfish behaviors. We can observe the population and see how it evolved uh, in this case, and perhaps at the end, they would have act selfishly. Now, what we want to see is that we'll now imagine that I add to this population a set of predefined agents that act in a pro-social manner or make the, the actions of others transparent. Can we equally simulate? Yes, we can simulate its evolution and observe if the presence of such agents indeed leads to a more pro-social society. And perhaps even stir the, the, the group into pro-social behavior. So these models can be more or less complex as we attempt to balance this complexity uh, uh, of the parameters with the, the fact that we need to represent and capture a wide variety of scenarios and situations. But the models function as predictive tools 
providing us a glimpse into a potential future where these technologies will come into the society. So we've been investigating uh, this with different dilemmas, settings, and society configurations. In the picture uh, that I'm showing there, um, the results of the simulation done with, uh, with many runs with the populations with the same game, showing that by adding a small percentage of pro-social agents is enough to get a propagating behavior and stir the population towards a path that is more pro-social. And in fact, these results, I believe, give us hope that indeed this technology and what we're trying to do in many ways will impact and have a, a large uh, impact. And in fact, more recently, with my collaborator, Francisco Santos, and the Radcliffe Research Partners, we've been investigating if these pro-social agents can have an impact in scenarios where we have divided societies separated in different groups in order to avoid parochialism. And uh, I hope to have some results in very soon. So uh, finally, I, oops, I want to finish by acknowledging there, uh, there's really amazing work in the social agents community, which I wasn't able to talk to you um, today. However, I hope I was able to give you a small snapshot of the challenges that we face in this area. And so in this world where AI is seen ever more with, as a negative factor of our society, I hope that I was able to provide you uh, a, a way by which AI can contribute to a kind of society. And AI must go beyond being social. It needs to be pro-social. Thank you. And now I give the virtual Thank floor you. to... Uh, Thank you, Anna. Um, Thank you so much. It was a terrific presentation, really fascinating. And as you can imagine, there are indeed questions. So in your last slide, you had a, a shank, uh, handshake. So if you don't mind, I'll go back to your experiments about handshake. And yeah. one of the question is, does the novelty of the handshakes wear off? Does the willingness to help the robot wear off over many encounters? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Certainly it does. It does. In fact, we've tested that. We, we've been um, looking at long-term interaction and seeing that certain behaviors, and especially uh, when it comes to interact with, with robots, the, the, the novelty effect is a big thing. So people are really keen on, uh, on doing things with the robot or, or helping. But you see, uh, in that case in particular, it was just the effect of the handshake. Now, of course, it could wear off over a long period of time, but just the first impression gives already some impact. And of course, there's techniques to start doing and, and adapting and, and uh, um, developing more um, uh, interaction that, that allow for long-term uh, long sustainable interaction with the robots. But it's, yeah, it wears off. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a research question at the moment, indeed. Right. And, uh, um, the next question is actually quite, quite interesting. So who decides which human behaviors are desirable? When does the robots nudging, persuading become a projection of power from the robot's creator on the people in the situation? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So who decides? Um, well, yeah, the designer. You see, that's that's the thing. If we look uh, from in one hand, we look at uh, scientific and uh, uh, psychological theories that uh, help us inform uh, the way we design. Okay. On the other hand, we also look at data. Like think about the the, the case of the the game. We captured. <laughs> we, we looked. Uh, at the data. So it's not 
the, the behaviors of, uh, of the agents are not um, coming from the mind of the designer. They are inspired uh, mostly by two things, data that we collect and theories that guide us, not only the collection of data, but also guide us the way we implement uh, those behaviors. And I think um, that gives us some assurance that, yeah, the, that the, the behavior is, is not just the designer that thinks that this is good and this is bad. No, there's theory and there's data behind that design decision. Um, yeah, that's a wonderful question. Indeed, um, we've been uh, looking at aspects, for example, uh, doing uh, what we call wizard of studies to, to capture data so that we can include them in the robots. So yeah, it's a um, it's very, very good question. And, and I believe that you need both. It's not only um, data that are out there, you need a series as well. Yeah. Mm. So the next question is actually very challenging. So it challenges the whole uh, vision of your work. So let me let me uh, phrase it for you. Why would it make more sense to uh, let the robot encourage social interactions uh, uh, with, with humans instead of getting the robot to pick up the trash, for example? So why it does it make sense to nudge humans to pick up the trash instead of you know, having the robot pick up the trash in the first place. Okay. Um, indeed. Um, yeah. Okay. But that means that we assuming that um, our um, technology is going to be able to do everything we want in one in one case. But um, so. I, I think that there's many situations where uh, you don't want the technology, the AI, to do all the tasks. You want it to collaborate with humans and you want humans to co collaborate with each other. And um, maybe the, the, the trash is, is not a good example, but um, for example, with the game, it, it's, it's clear that you, you don't, you, you can't have the agents do that job. You need to promote it in the human population. Um, so yeah, we can um, think that technology reaches a point that can do a lot more for us, can be slaves. In fact, uh, there's this, this notion of, uh, okay, if they're slaves, then we won't copy them because we just think that, well, they can do the, the job for us. But I, I also believe that that's at some point, uh, they become part of this, this fabric uh, um, of the relationships and, and he, he, they will impact also the social relationships that we have between ourselves. So I, yeah, now, can you repeat the question? Because I so yes, I, the question was: Would it make more? Would it be more effective to leave tasks that robot might be able to do more efficiently, like picking up trash, to robots, and leave encouraging social interactions to humans? But I think you answered the question. Basically, it depends on what you know. The picking up of the trash was a, an experimental example. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. fine. Okay, <laughs> so you mentioned the importance of robots portraying emotions. Yeah. How hard is it to engineer emotions in robots that humans fee, uh, find uh, uh, believable? Okay, um, that's a fantastic question. And it relates to a lot of the work that I've been doing for many, many years, for almost, I don't know, 10, 15 years. So I, I used to say that um, there's uh, many reasons why we want to have robots to express emotions but not only express, they can also have mechanisms underlying their decision-making that will help them to make better decisions if they have some kind of, uh, of uh, guide towards certain actions and that they can be in internal emotions. But think about uh, emotions for robots, it's not the same as emotions for humans, okay? I, we can get inspiration 
from the way humans uh, act, behave, interact, and then create that in the robots. The advantage of having robots or agents expressing emotions is that they um, become more natural, people collaborate more, and, and it becomes easier to interact. And in many situations, that is extremely important. Now, one thing is portraying, like I said, the other thing is decision making. Expressing emotions can have very positive effects. Perceiving emotions so that the system can adapt to the human's emotions is something that many people are working on is also important, although there's many um, uh, people contesting it. However, I think it's important to adapt to humans. Um, maybe emotions is perhaps not the right word, but to have some level of balance, it's positive or negative, arousal, it's, it's uh, exciting or not. Having those variables to perceive in the system and to express through the eyes and so on, it's important for establishing natural interactions with, this, with these robots and with these uh, agents and characters. Now, with the decision making, it's a little bit different because um, you can embed in the decision making, in the learning, some kind of um, heuristics that kind of resemble emotions. We cannot call them emotions, but it's something that may help the, pro the decision making. But that I wouldn't call it emotions. It's, it's inspired by human emotions that we can replicate in, uh, in our uh, machines, in, in our robots and agents. That's great, yes. Um, the next question, um, it's uh, about applications of, of pro-social behavior. Do you think that your pro-social software efforts can have an effect on driving and drivers through the software used in those cars? Okay, um, actually there's very interesting uh, work um, that is being um, done uh, recently. And I think is the team at Berkeley where uh where you put when you put um, a, a car an autonomous car uh driving and then you have humans driving what happens is by putting the autonomous car together with the humans you can stir the flow more easily so there may be um aspects even in cars and autonomous cars that uh are actually um, associated with this notion of pro-social behavior. But indeed, it's something that, that needs to be sought. Um, yeah. Perfect. Um, and the next question is, do you think that big tech uh, would adopt this pro-social approach? Well, I think they should. I think what's happening with some of the big tech and the social media uh, they should study more the effects uh, that um, they have uh, on the population before um, releasing and before doing things, and therefore studying how to make, for example, in, in Facebook, how to make people be more pro-social, support, um, uh, engage people in, in um, activities that uh, support each other perhaps would be very useful actually yeah i hope i would love to i have to be honest uh the next question is a technical question so do you use anthropomorphic sensors to get more empathic user to user relations mediated by computers or robots okay so the sensors we have uh and um okay in the depends on the scenarios very much on the scenarios in the case of the of the of the vz for example it was very limited uh, the the senses that we were collecting and, and using for the behavior because it was a uh, wizard but in the case of the of the the other um, 
robots that we have, and in fact, we've done a lot on, on empathy. Indeed, we have uh, trying to, to sense um, um, whether the, the user is uh, feeling frustrated, engaged, uh, and so on. So we are using some sensors uh, that gives us information about the user to, to decide and to adapt to that particular user. Um, yeah, but depends on the scenario. In the case of of the of the game of the for the record, the sense uh, we were sensing mostly what was going on on the table, uh, the game itself. Um, so it wasn't so much uh, getting um, other types of sensing um, in this. But the more senses we have, the best for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is. Um... Can we design pro-social robots before we've agreed on what constitute pro-social? So I guess, what do you mean by, by pro-social? Is that defined? Oh yeah, I mean, you, you, the idea or the definition of pro-social is, uh, 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 is a behavior that, um, that uh, is, uh, benefits someone else other than um, and the society at someone's cost. So I, I, I'm uh, walking in the street and I see someone uh, dropping uh, something on the street, I go and help and, uh, and give it. So I'm helping. Uh, it's, that's the, the definition of pro-social behavior. There's a lot of literature on these. For example, altruism is even more because it's this motivational state that, that uh, um, that it's a prosocial, it's prosocial, but it's even more because it's even um, the motivation is to increase the the welfare of others. It's, it's nothing. There's no result on one uh, oneself because in in situations, even if I help someone, I may feel happy about it. Right? I, I did a good deed. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, work on pro-social uh, behavior, amazing, uh, the, the, the psychology and social psychology work on that is so it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And the next question is, um, can you foresee any uh, negative effects uh, in these pro-social agents? Uh... Well, you see, the techno when we build technology, um, we need to test and we need to see whether there are positive and negative effects and try to avoid all the negative effects. I believe that um, it may uh, have situations where, uh, for example, there would be uh, some kind of uh, um, someone feeling uh, worse because interacted with a, with a with a nice robot, but I I think the negative effects are much 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 lower than than what we observe at the moment with technology that actually fosters the opposite to pro social behavior. So I believe that studying it to avoid is a way to. A, avoid studying it, uh, testing, um, and to avoid any kind of negative effects. I cannot, I mean, of course, there's uh, people might consider that, well, uh, there may be uh, negative effects of, uh, of uh, one action, but I, it depends on the situation. Actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and the next question is, is there any difference between robots, agents that are embodied and disembodied agents in promoting pro-social behavior? Okay, there is. <laughs> and I, I, I've been, I've worked and uh, some of my students have worked on that. And, um, and indeed, um, the physicality of a robot makes a big difference. People uh, give it more social presence. People give it more attention. People get more engaged. Even exactly the same scenario with more or less the same look and the robot and the virtual one, 
it makes a big difference. It also makes a difference when you have a dis completely disembodied agent. And in fact, we studied recently uh, with the same scenario uh, the, for, for the record, the same scenario with robots and completely disembodied agents. And what we observed was that people were more willing to collaborate when it wasn't embodied. And that was something we weren't expecting. We need to study it more. There was a kind of a um, negative effect of the body. So it's something that needs to be studied. But yeah, it's different. And, uh, and it's one of the challenges and, uh, and the community, both the robotics community, the social robotics community and the social agents or uh, virtual agents and the agents community are looking at these comparisons between the, the three types of agents. Yes, mm. it's, um, there are differences. Very good. And uh, one last question, uh, which is even uh, the most radical of all, I think. Should an AI be prevented from influencing human behavior? Well, yeah. So uh, that question, it's, um, it's a hard question because, uh, in fact, recently there was this, um, um, this big document uh, from the EU um, putting the laws uh, about AI. And one of the things it says is that AI sh should not uh, manipulate or, or influence human behavior. Now, the problem is technology, any technology we're using is influencing human behavior. It is, we cannot escape. Even Zoom, what, what we do, the way it's placed on the screen, everything is influencing us. So saying that AI cannot influence human behavior is wrong because then we cannot use technology. Mm -hmm. So what I believe and I truly believe is that AI should be aware of that or people that do should be, uh, AI should be aware of that and study its impact and make sure that the impact is the right thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Anna, uh, for the fascinating presentation and, and your insightful perspective. I also want to thank you, our audience, for the terrific questions. I hope you'll be able to join us for other Rackley Virtual programs. You can find out uh, about programs and watch videos of past events at rackleaf.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.